Good morning. Ordinarily, I would take this time to share some updates about Alabama CBF, uh, but Terry Bird, my boss and the coordinator for Alabama CBF, will be here next week. She gets to fight with the race weekend traffic, so I will let her come and share the Alabama CBF update next week. Does that sound okay with y'all? Does that work? Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 10, starting in verse 11, and it says this. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves and runs, and the sheep are attacked by the wolf, and the wolf scatters them. He's only the hired hand, and the sheep don't matter to him. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I give up my life for the sheep. This is the word of God, and it is for us today. Thanks be to God. So I ruined the biblical image of shepherds for myself a few years back when I was the associate minister at River Chase Baptist Church in Hoover. It was my first church out of seminary, and I just didn't know any better, so I decided to actually learn some things about the shepherds. We were doing an Advent Reflection, we're on each Sunday during Advent, the four Sundays leading to Christmas, we uh, approached the story from a different character uh, from the biblical story of the birth of Jesus. One week was Mary, one week was Joseph, one week was the shepherds, and I got to do the shepherds week. So I did all this reading um, from, from history and um, from biblical context and a bunch of commentaries and what the life of a, of a shepherd was was really like, and this is what I've learned, uh, turns out, you know, I, in my mind, I thought of shepherds as one of two things. I either pictured them as these, um, you know, wealthy gentlemen, you know, who, they obviously had land and, and sheep, to, animals to graze on their land, um, so I thought they were wealthy, well-respected members of the community, or I thought of them as the tiny little uh, nativity scene actors we see, the seven and eight-year-old shepherds, you know, the ones we see at Christmas time. I thought they were either adorable or super respectable. Uh, it turns out that if you believe what you can find in history, that some, uh, some of them are like the, the hired hands that Jesus talks about in our scripture. In fact, that's where most of the actual shepherding, that's who did most of the actual shepherding. The ones who lived out on the hillside with the sheep, they weren't the wealthy uh, men or their sons who actually owned the land and owned the sheep and who made the money from the sheep. Uh, these were guys that were hired to come out there. So they didn't, uh, it wasn't really the best job in the world. Would, would you want to go live on a hillside uh, with a bunch of sheep? I, I certainly uh, would not want to live on a hillside with a bunch of sheep, to, to live out there, to eat out there, um, to not bathe out there, obviously. So these people didn't have great hygiene. Um, and thinking about the, the moment and history in which they lived, you know, there weren't dentists, there weren't doctors. Um, these are some pretty grisly fellows, which, I, which in the sun, sermon I preached the Sunday of the shepherd focus for that year's of Ad, Advent, I talked about it really altered the perception of who was showing up to worship this little baby in the manger. Instead of these adorable little, you know, precious seven or eight-year-old shepherds or these stately, respectable shepherds, instead these gnarly-teethed, um, poorly, poor hygiene, uh, probably wearing bits of rags, smelling of sheep, people showed up. And what do you imagine Mary's reaction was? What would your reaction be as a mother or a father? You'd stay away from my baby, please. It really changes the story. It, it did for me. So when Jesus is talking today about the fact that he is the good shepherd, when he tells the story of the, of the hired hands who run for the woods, who run for cover when the, sh when the wolves show up, I'll have to admit that if I were the hired hands, I would do the same thing. It's sort of a crazy concept, isn't it? To think of a human being, one of us, choosing to, to lay down our, our life, to, to come between a sheep and a wolf. Jesus says uh, the hired hands run for cover. Those are the ones I think that are pretty smart. But Jesus says the, the good shepherd stays and defends 
the sheep. I hope with a great big pokey stick or something, right? I don't know what he's using to defend the sheep, but I hope he has some weapon of some kind. You know, I don't have any experience hurting anything at all, which I thought a lot about when I was driving out here from, from Birmingham, a lot of animals out in the fields, and I was like, some of you probably have experience hurting things. I have none. Um, only experience I have counting or hurting things, um, keeping track of things, are children. Um, the two that I have of my own, but I also, uh, in earlier in life when I was in college, I was a camp counselor. In my first year there, we had uh, 20, I had the new campers program. So there were four or five counselors in charge of 20 brand new campers. They were there for one week and they'd never, most of them had never been away from home overnight from their parents. This sounds like a great plan, right? Let's all cram them into a cabin together and not lose them for a week. So I, you know, I really obsessed over counting. I was like, one, two, three. All, every time we moved, every time we left the cabin, arrived anywhere. And one day after nap time, um, we got the boys up and we're going to hunt for crawdads at the creek. And we got walking across the field. And it dawned on me, I had not counted the boys as we left the cabin. So I was one, two, three, four, 19. Well, just be 20. One, two, three, four, 19. I was like, wait a minute, everyone stop. And I made the boys stop and I counted them. I looked them each in the face and I was like, we are missing Michael. There was a kid named Michael who just wasn't there. And so we were all scrambling around. We'd gone a few minutes walk from the cabin. So we were scrambling around looking for him. So I um, tell the other counselors, y'all stay here. And I retrace our tracks all the way back to the cabin. I burst into the cabin, having not found Michael all on the way. And Michael is tucked in, still sound asleep in his sleeping bag. And we couldn't see his little head. He was down inside of it. And I was like banging on the bed. There he is. I found him. Um, and I was so relieved to find little lost Michael. The story reminds me, in both my sense of joy over the recovery of my 20th camper, a story that Jesus tells in Luke 15, also related to being a shepherd. He says, if there was a shepherd who had 100 sheep, he would leave the 99 to go find the one uh, that got lost. Like if he was counting one night, and you go all up to 99, 97, 98, 99, where's my 100th sheep? Jesus says the shepherd would leave the 99 to go find the one that is missing. Again, I understand that Jesus, you know, being God and all, probably knows what he's talking about. To me, it just seems odd to put myself in between the sheep and the wolf. Or, you know, I have the 99 and there's just one missing. And really, where is the one? What, what has happened to the one sheep? I mean, let's, let's, let's think about it for a minute. Let's see. He has either been eaten by something, the aforementioned wolf, um, devoured, or he's lost in the woods and will soon be eaten by the wolf. I mean, what's the harm? I mean, he's, he's probably already gone. What's the harm in taking care of the 99 I know that I have and just letting the one go? But Jesus says no. The shepherd goes and hunts down, goes, in, goes away from the warmth and the safety of the place where the other shepherds are and where the sheep are and wanders out into the darkness to find the one that is missing. And in Luke, Jesus tells a sequence of stories about lost things. It's the story of the lost sheep, and he tells the story of the lost coin, where the woman loses the silver coin, and she searches her whole house over to find it. She sweeps everywhere and finds it, and when she finds it, she calls all the neighbors over to rejoice. That that which is lost has been found. This precious thing has come home again. And then the most famous, probably, of the lost things story is the story of the lost son, or the prodigal son. In each of these cases and in the story this morning, our scripture this morning from John, I would say um, Jesus is presenting a, a theme of, that if we were viewing it from the perspective of the world in which we live, we would say it's backwards. There's something backwards about risking human life for the life of an animal. There's something backwards about leaving the safety and, 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 and disregarding the security of the 99 sheep for the one. There's something a little nutty about cleaning your whole house to find the one coin and then throw in a party, probably spending more than the one coin, to celebrate the return of the one coin. And being the eldest son, I have never understood, you know, how the prodigal gets welcomed back in by the good father. I mean, come on. I'm over here getting it right. They're the ones not. 
this whole getting ready for the sun, this Sunday sermon and reading these scriptures has gotten me thinking about a lesson I taught in Sunday school on Palm Sunday, which I didn't do a very good job of teaching, I don't think, because everyone sort of looked at me like, I don't know what you meant to say by that, but thanks for saying it. Um, they, I, don't, I don't know if Chris or anyone who's ever preached here on a Palm Sunday has ever talked about Palm Sunday in the context of... Um, in those days, you know, that uh, Jerusalem was occupied uh, by the Romans. And so when Passover came around, which was the time of year that, um, you know, the events in Palm Sunday took place, it was a celebration of liberation. It was remembering that, Jesus, that God had one time saved the Hebrews um, from Egypt. So they were celebrating liberation. And it made the Romans nervous. And so they would send in more soldiers. They'd march them right into the city. Huge parades and war horses and um, people with spears and lots of clanking armor to remind the Hebrews who were an oppressed people that I know you're celebrating liberation, but let's don't get crazy with it. Let's not get any ideas in your head. And we're going to remind you by bringing in more soldiers, marching them right through the city. And in that context, to think about Jesus riding on the back of a borrowed donkey with his ragtag group of fishermen and, and the whoever's of society celebrating him. If you contrast that against the mighty parades and shows of power that had already been done in the city, if Jesus did that on purpose, I passed a donkey on the way here. <laughs> I had to laugh. I was like, I couldn't imagine my Lord and Savior on the back of that thing. But that's what he picked. He said, let me show you what the kingdom of God is like. It's like God Almighty humbled into human form, riding on the back of the silliest looking animal you can imagine. Let me show you what it looks like in contrast to the power of this world. Now, I taught a longer version of that lesson on Palm Sunday, and then I got that home that evening, and your pastor had posted an illustration that a pastor from Richmond had posted. And he said this, and I wish I had thought to say this, because the lesson would have been over in two minutes. He said, in my office, this pastor said, in my office I have this yardstick that on one side is 0 to 36, and on the other side, opposite side is 36 to 0. You all probably have seen a yardstick like this. He said, this is how God measures our accomplishments in the kingdom. You can stack up all of your worldly accomplishments on one side, and if you want to see what God thinks about it, you flip it over. You see, those who appear to have accomplished a lot in this world may have accomplished very little for the kingdom of God. And those who have accomplished seemingly nothing in this world may have accomplished a great deal for the kingdom of God. What matters is the one who is measuring I wish I had thought of that. That's pretty smart, right? It's Pastor Somerville in First Baptist Richmond. That's who gets the credit for that one. But it's good. Every morning uh, when I get up, you know, make a cup of coffee, make my children breakfast, get them dressed and out the door for school, then I take five or ten minutes where I go and make my bed. I like to make my bed in the morning. <laughs> I like to leave the house knowing that it's there and ready for me to come back to at the end of the day. I also like to make my children's beds. So I'll go into the rooms and I'll tidy up. I'll pick up whatever happens to be sitting around on the floor, pick up the clutter, tidy it up a little bit. And then I will try to push out of my mind whatever plans and things I'm thinking about that are in my head. I'll try to push it out of my mind for a moment as I'm pulling the sheets up in my children's beds and sorting out their stuffed animals. I'll pray for them. And I almost always pray this uh, same thing. I ask God that that my children would be so confident in the love that they know from their parents, from their mother and me, and from their church family, from their grandparents. God, that may they be so confident in the love that we have for them that it makes them brave, that they are fearless in the giving away of love, that my children love others with abandon. I tell my son often in the morning when he goes to school, be kind and be brave, brave enough to be kind. Show others the love of God that you know. Show others the, the absurd devotion that God gives to us and be confident in it. 
Because though you may be lost, God is coming to find you. God has come to find you. Though you may be in danger, God will place God's self in between you and the danger. Though you may feel ashamed because you have done wrong, it is okay. Because your God is the good Father who wraps his arm around you and welcomes you home. It's the kind of confidence I want my children to be filled with so they are not afraid to go out and love the world. In John, in 1 John, it says this. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It says, when we give ourselves a way to love, when we are so sold out to love, love inhabits our lives. It's like love takes up residence inside of us. And when love does that, love squeezes out all the room for fear. Fear chokes out life. But love, when love fills us up, it pushes out all the shadow of any space where fear can come. In these stories, it is interesting to me that the emphasis is not placed on the recklessness of the sun or the, or the silliness of a sheep to get lost or the helplessness of a sheep to be attacked by a ferocious animal. It's not placed on any of those faults or failings. It is placed on the goodness of the shepherd. It is placed on the goodness of the father it is placed on the goodness of the owner of the coins who sweeps the house to find the thing that has been lost. The emphasis is placed on the goodness of the one who loves us with abandon. My prayer for you and for me this week as we go into this world, may we go and love others because we know how deeply and truly we are loved. May we go and care for others and share goodness with others because we have known the goodness of the good shepherd. Because we have known we will, we will never truly be lost. And even if we think we are, God is on his way. May we all go and live our lives secure in the knowledge of the good, good God who loves us. Amen.